Muy bien, damas y caballeros, el señor Rimas Pacalnis, presidente de Pacalnis Associates, denominada, va a presentar su conferencia denominada Métodos Empíricos de Diseño de Minas Subterráneas. Pero déjenme comentar para que conozcamos un poco más a él. Cuenta con más de 30 años de experiencia en minería subterránea. Ha formado parte de más de 150 operaciones subterráneas en todo el mundo. Es profesor emérito de la University of British Columbia y actualmente asesora a reconocidas compañías mineras a nivel internacional. Ha sido designado como experto por las agencias federales de Canadá y Estados Unidos en el campo de la mecánica de rocas. Su labor es considerada fundamental en el desarrollo de herramientas de diseño empíricos para la industria minera. Démosles un fuerte aplauso, por favor. Gracias, and thank you very much, uh, Engineer Carlos Soto, and thank you. I, I was uh, said I have about a half an hour unt until the break, but much, much of, much of the slides are in the. Uh, in the uh, proceedings, so maybe uh, we can have a we could have a few questions afterwards. Much of the work that I have done, and it's nice to see here, uh, was uh, based upon the empirical methods that were developed over the last 20 years at the University of British Columbia in Canada. These methods are used throughout the world, uh, and you'll see some of the examples here with the Immaculata, with Hochi, and Andichagua, with Minsur, and San Rafael, and Sarah Lindo, Milpo, and uh, Ruben from uh, Belo Horizonte uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, Chihuahua Mine up there. So you'll see many different examples. And what I would like today is just to look at what the, the objective here is to look at what has been used I've worked at mining operations uh, presently. I'm a consultant, and I am also uh, work with the University of British Columbia as an emeritus, as I retired uh, uh, four years ago. In everything we do, we have to look at the, uh, to quantify our rock mass. We look at using numerical models. We look at using uh, analytical tools. Uh, just like uh, Freddie Namami mentioned uh, previously, observational techniques, uh, all of that into the overall design process. What we try to do more recently is the work of uh, uh, employing systems like what you see here, looking at stress, structure, and the rock mass. And the objective here is to identify and determine how they all relate to each other. The success of uh, mining methods and so forth, rock mechanics and mining over the last 20 years, 30 years, the most of it has every mine uses an empirical approach based upon what some other operation has used and trying to relate it to something that you will use at your operation. It does not say you don't do numerical modeling or analytical. It is just one of the things in your toolbox that you will use. So that's what I'm here to present today, some of the tools that we, we have looked at. In everything we do in empirical design, we have to identify the, uh, how reliable they are. And one of the things we look at is we must interpolate and not extrapolate. And interpolate means we have to have to know thy database. You have to know the information that you have, you have compiled. If your mind is away from that database, then what the problem is, is you will not necessarily have the best uh, input. So you have to know the database and assuming your operation fits in that database. So the empirical methods, many are used 
but they're very confusing in many instances. Much of this is being uh, alleviated now with the uh, empirical course we had two years ago in the conference uh, that was in Lima and presently uh, with the ISRM and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Commission on uh, Empirical Methods. And in this, in this talk, everything I will look at is looking at analytical also with, coupled with extensive field experience to arrive at something that is a calibrated approach towards the solution for a given problem. In everything we had, we have a given problem. So we tried to find it. We all say mining is different. Every mine is different. It's not different. I worked at 170 underground mines consulting. Every mine has maybe has the same problem in many cases. And the Chagua has cement, uh, a very poor roof. So they use underhand mining. Nevada, we have the same thing in the United States. You look at Cerro Lindo, 20,000 ton per day Milpo operation, transverse open stoping. They're very unique is that they're producing more than any transverse open stoping mine in the world. However, it's the same approach. So the tools that we have here are used at every individual operation. I'm going to Russia next week with, with Kinross, Kupal, and Divinoya. We have the same issue. Oh, so we'll take it off? Okay. That's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That should be better. So we're looking at the same system. For example, in Russia, we're looking at a rock having to be uh, minus 10 degrees centigrade because the cooling the rock makes the rock mass so much stronger. Cameco in Canada, we do that by freezing. So it's very similar concerns. So when we look at this, oops, we try to identify and quantify. So we try to quantify our rock mass. 100, 80, 60, 40, 20. We try to quantify whether you use the Q system or the RMR, it doesn't matter as long as you quantify the rock mass. We also look at the stress and the structure that could potentially cause a concern. We then take a look, for example, at the uh, a long hole open stoping. This was developed by Lyndon Clark at UBC, is the ELOS. And that's the equivalent linear overbreak slough. That's how much wall could potentially fall in to the open stope. So what we look at is we look at the volume of the slough and divide that by the ore blasted. So that gives us meters of wall slough. And from that, you develop this relationship, which you see here. The stability number, but you also have meters of wall that will come in for dilution estimates. And the concern here is, is that depending upon hydraulic radius, is blast damage is 0.5 meters. And that's very good for Cerro Lindo, for ex where their stopes may be 20, 25 meters wide, because 0.3 meters uh, or 0.5 meters blast damage on both walls is one meter. So one meter and 20 is, is less than 5% dilution. But when we work at another mine, such as Richmond in Canada, our ore body is only three meters wide. So if we have half a meter here and half a meter in the hanging wall, we have one meter and one meter divided by three is 33% dilution. So that's an exceptionally high value. So it's not, not good for that. So what we try to do is estimate by using transverse open stoping. Uh, this is uh, similar, to in, this is in Guatemala, San Rafael operation. But by using transverse stoping and trying to identify 
how, what strength of backfill we need in order to ensure that the backfill will not fall in. So that's one of the factors we have to estimate. And I believe, uh, Dr. Soto, you have uh, Dave Stone giving a talk on Thursday. And he will be sp speaking to that as well. This is the radius factor. It's very similar to the hydraulic radius, but Doug Milne, a PhD uh, at UBC who finished, who's now at the University of Saskatchewan, and by the way, they will be hosting this, the second international conference on empirical design, where the first was at Lima. And what they have is they look at not just the hydraulic radius, which is the area divided by the perimeter, they look at a similar approach, just the distance from a single point, this may be plan view, to the wall, and they estimate the distance of that ray, the length of that ray divided by the number of rays. And that's an equivalent to the hydraulic radius. But in turn, what that does is it gives you an estimate of effective hydraulic radius at every location. As you get closer to the wall, the hydraulic radius is very low. As you get in the middle, the effective radius factor in the middle is very close to the hydraulic radius. So it's a value that's used to estimate where in the roof it is more stable. So a corner is more stable than the center. We also look at the span relationship. The span relationship looks at uh, the rock mass rating <coughs> on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is how big the opening is in the roof. So you're looking at the size of the, of the span or the distance from one wall to the next. Well, what you're looking at here, it'll estimate for that whether it's going to cave or be stable with 1.8 meter bolts. Those bolts are either split sets or mechanical bolts. So effectively it says no bolts. And therefore what we're trying to estimate, for example, in different operations, is, the, is shall we have to ensure that if it does fail, for example, if our rock mass is 50%, and we increase the span to 20 meters, it falls there, and it's in the cave zone. So when that caves, it's going to cave to one half the span. So if our span is 20 meters, it will cave 10 meters above the roof. And that's based upon many measurements. It'll arch. So when you have 10 meters, that's a good thing to know because you can support it before it caves, and therefore it will not, it has longer bolts. So we also have the pillar design, and the pillar design is used universally, and what it does is developed by Per Lunder at the University of British Columbia, and who's now the manager of De Beers Snap Lake in Canada. And here what we're looking at is the width to height ratio and at various degradation. So we're trying to estimate a design curve. And as you can see here, I can just put this here, is the pillar graph. And the pillar graph looks at the width to height, for example, a two to one ratio as you come up. This is a factor of safety here of 1.4 and a factor of safety here of one. The difference is, is in all these cases, let's see what time, in all these cases, what you're looking at is trying to estimate is it going to be cave or will it be stable? And that's one of the approaches that you see in the, uh, in the relationship. We define the width of the stope as measured perpendicular to the induced stress. So if the induced stress is coming in this direction, that's the width, and the height is measured in the direction of the stress. We also look at the dead weight. 
And the dead rate, we estimate by a pole plot. This is all done underground, all done prior to coming up from surface. And what we're looking at here is trying to look at, on a stereo net or a pole plot underground, if the poles that we record encompass the center. If they encompass the center, just like here, the three great circles, then you have a dead weight failure potential. That means there is no cohesion, the friction angle doesn't matter, it can just fall vertically. And when that happens, what you have to look at is you have to support the weight of that wedge with bolts or shot creep. And so that's one of the approaches that we're looking at is that if it doesn't encompass the center, as you see here, you have a sliding wedge, which is what you have. And what that what results in is you have friction angle and so forth. And what that means is the factor of safety is so much higher. In Mexico, I work with uh, Kerr and uh, Mulatos Operation and, and many others. And what we call it there is the witch's hat. So we tell the operator, if you have a major structure this way, look at another one in this direction. And they call the witch's hat something else. And I'm sure if I listened to the translator, I would know. But they call it the witch's hat. We now look at and estimate, yes, this is done from underground. We use unwedge. To, if we do, we do the mapping, we will use unwedge. The difficulty is if you don't have unwedge underground immediately, and you want to estimate, do I have a potential for a deadweight wedge? Well, this gives you an idea whether those bolts that you're putting in are, uh, are, do have to work. And if, as such, then you can, if you design for the deadweight wedge, you then look at unwedge or some other program to analytically determine the volume and the interaction of your bolts. Uh, this here is the estimate of the dead weight. So what we have is one half span. And what you're looking at is the volume of this wedge. If this wedge is on a pattern, one meter by one meter, that's the bolting. That means the volume of that will be one half the span. And the span is five meters. So one half the span times the height. And we're saying the worst case, the height will fail to two and a half meters because this is five meter span. So one half times the span, uh, so two and a half meters times one meter into the page. One meter into the page times the specific gravity. And in this case, uh, the specific gravity of the ore, ore waste is three tons, it's three. So it's three tons per cubic meter. So that gives you the, the, the weight of your wedge. And in this case, 19 tons. We then look at the bolt. We always start with one in the middle, because that's a standard. I look after Barrick operation, uh, Kinross, uh, who else? Barrick, Kinross, some of the big ones. Uh, up in uh, Cameco's operations, uh, Newcrest in Indonesia. We all use one half span. Australia, use, Newcrest uses s something very similar. It's what it is, is it looks at this and says, in the worst scenario, that's what we have. Well, you should map. We always map. And if you map and you find you don't have that, or the rock mass is sufficiently strong, then you design for what you have, the structure. But when you don't map, your due diligence tells you you have to design for one half span. Or you have to give guidance to say, I'm not going to get that failure. So what we look at is we estimate the amount of bolts that go through the joint surface. And that means that's the bond strength. And in this case, we're looking at rebar. And the bond strength here for a weak rock mass is 19 tons per meter. So one meter of rebar past the joint surface will fail 19 tons. Now, the strength of the rebar in breaking 
is 18 tons. So you need to have about 0.9 meters of that bar in order for it to fail. If you only have 0.3 meters, that's not, no longer an 18 ton bar. It would be a seven ton or nine ton bar. So that gives you your factor of safety. Just the, the, uh, the support capacity divided by the weight. You need to have a factor of safety 1.2 for temporary and 1.5 for permanent. This here just shows the, I was uh, working with the SVS, Cerro Lindo, last February. <clears throat> and what they found is they looked at all their stopes and they found that the span was for a 20 meter wide stope, for example, failed to 10 meters. This curve was about one half the span based upon 30 measurements of, of failures at the mine. But looking at the final wall geometry, not your design geometry, they design for 20 and they get 30. So when it fails, it goes to 30. So 30 fails, it goes to 15 high. So those are the values and it's so important to record the data. And then you believe your data, just like here. And also the other thing is to look at <clears throat> is screen and shot creep. For example, by using screen, that won't confine the rock necessarily, but the shot creep itself will form a member that's going to confine this as a single unit. We still need the bolts to hold up the, the dead weight, but this shot creep here holds it up as a single mass. <clears throat> we have to do pull tests, and that's what you see here. But pull tests over a length uh, of half a meter, a, a embedment length that is isolated. If you have a 2.4 meter bolt, there's no purpose to do a pull test because you will always break steel. In good rock, good rock is 55% rock mass rating. Rock mass of 55 and you've got rebar, you only need 0.3 meters past the joint to break 20 ton. So when you put in 2.4 meter rebar and you pull, you're always gonna break steel. So you have to put in half a meter to measure or one or some isolated length because the pull test will tell you just what the bond is. And the bond is the weak link. This just looks at, this is work done by the US Bureau of Mines uh, in Spokane. And what this is, is work that our group as well has done, trying to determine how much, and this is the work of Barton and, uh, and Grimstad, how much shot creep is to be used. And it depends on the rock, the weakness of the rock. And that has been used uh, throughout the world, as well as Andachagua, where you're you're looking at 25%, 30% rock mass rating. And that in turn tells you how thick the shock treat is. And then you bolt through the shock treat. And that will hold the material together. And that's the purpose of this study. We also look at an intersection. And when you have an intersection, we look at the bolts that go through the intersection, the volume of that intersection that fails to one half span. We then take a look at the individual bolts and ensure that the bond strength exceeds the weight of those bolts. And what we have to do, oh, that's just, and what we have to do is to make sure that when we design for this, is that we have a factor of safety of 1.5 for permanent and 1.2 for temporary. Now, if you say, I'm going to do my mapping, and I don't have that structure, then you have done your due diligence, and we know you then don't have to do one half span. Or if the rock mass is so weak that it's not structure controlled, it's rock mass, then you have to put in your shot treat and your bolts in order to hold that material up. And this just shows you trying to look at 180, 60 rock mass. Well, in 
um, Nevada, our rock mass was 40 and 20. And in 1980s, we had oh, about eight fatalities in, in 13 months in big operations. You know, the barracks, the placer domes, and, and so forth, and, and Newmont's. And the difficulty is, is that we didn't have a database. Our database was based upon the strong rock operations. And so what we looked at was the weakness, the, 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 and therefore we developed our database. And there was a big project with the government and ourselves to develop it. And that's what you see down in the bottom. That's the weakest rock mass. We say that's 15% rock mass rating. That's when you can push your finger into the rock. And so what you see on the left-hand side same hydraulic radius, but it does not work, the stability graph, for weak rock. So you have to develop it just for weak rock. And at the same time, the same work was being done in Australia by a fellow called Cavers and a result at Mount Isa. And a result here says at 3.5 meter hydraulic radius, we're able... <coughs> Oops. Okay. There we go. At 3.5 meter hydraulic radius, which represents a stope that is uh, 40 meters in vertical height by 12 meters in length, you're able to hold that material out. So this here looks at about a 35% rock mass rating. So we had a tremendous amount of dilution, and that's what you see. So we had to reduce the amount, the size of our stopes. And that's what you see here, where the size of the stopes was uh, 20, sorry, 20 meters high, as you see, 20 meters vertical, and the strike length was 12 meters. So the hydraulic radius was 3.5 meter. And that we're able to mine rock that we can push our finger in. This just looks at uh, different mines of, of spiling when to result in that, <clears throat> have to use spiling or short rounds, because we have the database. When you have 25% rock mass rating, you're now in a situation where you have to start looking at spiling or short rounds of one meter, two meter. Or, as barracks operation, if you have 25% rock mass rating, you drill the, the, uh, the entire face, but you don't, uh, you just blast the bottom from the mid-height to the bottom and everything else comes in. So those are things that are, we adopted to reduce blast damage for weak rock. The arch is critical. <clears throat> for one thing is your, your dead weight, if you, if you look at your arch, you remove that arch because of the, you produced a natural arch. We also, uh, Christian Caceres, in his PhD, he's now a professor at, in Santiago at a mining school, and what he or he did is he looked at uh, the distance from a blast and the kilograms of explosive, but the weaker the rock is, the lower the PPV. And I noticed a few papers after this session are on open pit blast control. There's a very huge difference in how weak rock mass behaves and how strong rock mass behaves. So as you see, the strong rock mass, the PPV is very high recorded. And that tells us much in terms of what we can uh, detonate. And this is a, a discussion by uh, Christian Casadas uh, in Spanish about uh, our location, how we conducted the tests. RQD, another thing to, to look at, and I included this slide mainly because of to use common sense in rock mechanics. If you have core that you can break in your hand, push your finger in it, the RQD is zero. The joints per meter, the spacing, zero. It's not based upon, you know, you say, well, it looks like I, it comes out as a strong piece. Because you know that when you go in and mine underneath it, it's going to break up. So we do not 
try to estimate the RQD. The definition by ISRM and, and by Don Deere was based on sound core. So what you're looking at is core that we can break up uh, and also, for example, core that's disked, but it's already just by mild hand pressure to break, it's zero. Don't get a PhD and figure out why it should be 80 because I've been to many mines, big mines, chemical one, and this is consultants said, well, the definition says ISRM is greater than four inches or 10 centimeter. But it's your definition of sound core. To me, sound core is when you go like this, it's not sound, you can break it. So use common sense because you have to put a life under that roof. We use backfill and the backfill is more so going to be looked at with Dave Stone, <clears throat> but much of this has looked at the span that we open up, the thickness of the sill mat, and the UCS that you require. And if you look at the numbers under Chagua is at the very bottom, and they used 21%, uh, I believe, uh, cement and opened up uh, 15 meter spans and, and greater, 20 meter. The problem is in Canada and North America, we open up with 5% uh, or 10% cement, and we max we open is six meters, five, six, because that's all you need to put a mechanized equipment underneath that roof. Otherwise, you're paying too much for cement, and you don't need that strength. So these are some of the things that Anachagua has implemented with SVS and so forth, quite successfully in reducing <clears throat> the costs. And this just shows you the Stillwater mine uh, and also at the Chagua, that's, that's their point right here, 16. And you can see that point, they're the, they're the strongest mine in the world that uses cement underground. And also they're a big span, they're 15 meters. And also they have 16 megapascal strength. And the difficulty with all of that is uh, it works, but it costs. And therefore, typically we use one megapascal for six meters and 10% cement for paste backfill. And, and, and it does work. And this just shows you the database. These are all mines in that previous database. This just shows you some, uh, the Chagua, 15 meters, Gold Corp, Red Lake, six meters, uh, Kinchana mine in, the, in uh, Indonesia, six meters. And uh, Murray mine, cemented rock fill, and that's uh, 12 meters. And this just shows you a simple beam looking at some testing. The only reason I show this is that we say the strength of paste or uh, CRF is one tenth the tensile strength is one-tenth of UCS. We found that the strength from back analysis and from actually pulling is closer to uh, one-fifth. It's, it's twice as big. And what that tells you is that when we say it's 16 megapascal, the strength of it might be 32 megapascal. And that's a big difference because we never have a sill mat that fails, generally. Then we look at backfill. How strong? You don't need much strength in the vertical backfill wall. And that's what you see here. And that's what you see in terms of uh, by, Knight, by uh, Mitchell and actually Dave Stone, who will be here on Thursday. That's his, Dave Stone is a student of Dr. Mitchell's, a PhD student. This here just shows you points from uh, uh, freezing. It's probably not a big problem here in Peru, freezing. <laughs> It is in Russia, it is in Canada, but what the advantage is, is it increases the rock mass by 20. So 15 RMR becomes 35 frozen, but a 35 RMR frozen becomes 15 and less when it thaws, and that's a problem. Then this just shows you what we do in chemical, MacArthur, the uranium mine, we, the red is we freeze the entire 
area. It's all frozen in a, one of the operations I worked with. This here is from uh, the point frozen is the blue, non-frozen is the white. So we can see we get an increase of about 20%, 20 value on the weaker material. The area that you see down here is in Russia. And in Russia, Kinross uh, Kupol mine, we're looking at values that, uh, again, rock mass is 60. When we look at it, it's frozen. But unfrozen, it's close to 20 or 30. This is unfrozen, 20 and 30. And this is frozen at 60. The problem is the engineers say Geologists, they just broke the core. It's just bad core. They don't know how to drill. And it's worse in Russia because, you know, it's all in Russian. So we have, you know, the old Russian, which is more KGB, and the young Russian who are young and like ready to, 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 to find out the real answer. And there is no solution. And then we have the Canadian. And so what we find is it is weak, and so we wait one year, two years, when you have much vehicles, much trucks, traffic, and it gets hot, like here, and it gets hot. And what happens? It melts and the roof collapses, even with cable bolts. And this just shows you some of the barrack, the cave of the roof, the weak rock mass, and understanding. The whole idea is trying to understand the failure mechanism. We spoke about that already, spying, and that's a standard for weak rock material. The other thing we extended to is, is blast, is micro seismicity. And what we do is we look at the source, and the source would be a Nutley or a, a, or a, or a uh, MN uh, kilojoules, and we divide that by the surface area of a sphere. Four thirds pi r cubed, pi r squared, sorry, the surface area. And that will tell us how many kilojoules per meter squared will, will be effective on the closest drift. We then relate the absorption that a bolt has to absorbing this stretch. And the absorption is just the force over distance, and it's just the area under the curve of the force displacement for the, for the bolt. So the more rubbery the bolt is, the more energy it can absorb. And as we said, is use your common sense. You see a, bolt, a rib pillar or a little pillar, you say, it's not doing anything. You always question it, but it isn't doing anything. You take it out, nothing happens. But we also look at the structure. This just shows you a work done in the 70s where you looked at our, this trona. And what they did is they tested uh, vertical sample, one, one uh, width high, four, meter, four widths, four heights uh, in height, one width wide. And you ended up getting anywhere from five MPA down to our standard of, uh, let's say, one width uh, wide and two uh, widths high to about 10 MPA. But when you got close to 10 widths wide and one width, uh, one height, so 10 to 1, very wide, we ended up getting about 100 megapascal of strength. And Trona is not that strong. So what happened here is you got crushing in the floor and huge energy release. And that's what we find in mines like Lucky Friday, where we have a very wide pillar. And this was the fellow who looked at this. His name was Jack Parker, and he developed the first work in terms of empirical design. And he said, you have to think like the rock. I thought it was me who always said that, but it was him. And so thank you very much. And uh, we have some questions. I think we, it's 11.34. Um, but again, in the old days, when we said the roof is falling, no one believes us. Because we always said the roof is falling. Because numerical modeling said, you know, we got hundredth of a millimeter of movement. Our instrument said hundreds of a millimeter, thousands of a millimeter. But today, when the roof is, we say the roof is falling, it is falling. Because we base it upon a hundred other mines and real data. And modeling is part of it. 
but it's based upon observation and measurement. And we measure millimeter, for example, in 24 hours. So everything we do it has to be safe. Education is the critical for everything. It's so nice to see so many students here because we do this course, we do this throughout the world, but it's just Russia, we have this, the same thing that you see here in Russian and Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, the yellow book we call it. And everything it is, uh, it's, it's for safety. And thank you, gracias. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Primas. Quisiéramos agradecer al doctor Rimas Pacalnis por esta interesante conferencia. El señor Pacalnis se va a quedar acá hasta el jueves. ¿Tengo Thursday o Thursday? Hasta el jueves va a estar acá en la convención. Si quieren eh, preguntarle algo, pueden acercarse a él ahora en el, en el break o en cualquier momento. Y tiene bastante experiencia acá en el Perú, ha venido a hacer varios trabajos de consultoría. Y por eso tiene ejemplos peruanos, ¿no? Ha trabajado en Andaychagua, ha trabajado en Cerro Lindo. Y estamos en el instituto pensando realizar un segundo curso de diseño empírico, diseño de excavaciones subterráneas por métodos empíricos. Esperamos anunciarlo pronto para que puedan participar quienes tengan interés. Muchas gracias. Muy bien. Okay, based upon uh, uh, mapping. Okay, so. Va a responder esta pregunta. En realidad debe haber muchas más, pero no 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 quisiéramos dejar a todos acá sentados durante mucho rato. Bueno, por lo menos está acá que es un tema que, ha, que ha, además el trabajo de él está en los análisis. Hay un CD con la presentación para quienes tengan interés de verlo más detalle. ¿eh? So uh, that's a, a good question. There was a paper as well that we have on, on the mapping. And what we do is, uh, I have my, my pen. Oh, it does? Okay. I'll just take that here. Okay. Okay, so what we do is we, we take the strike and dip, actually we take the dip and dip direction of a, a single joint in a phase. So if we look at this, uh, the next phase here, we record the feature that you see and that has, joint set one has a dip of 90 degrees and a dip direction of 200. So with a compass, we record the dip and dip direction, or strike and dip. So we record at least three features, three joints, or faults, or, or such. What we then do is we plot the point on here. So if we look at joint set one, joint set one had a dip direction of 200. And so you go to 200 on the uh, on the outside, there's 200, and you, and you measure the, the dip from the center in. And the dip of this 
was, uh, let's say joint set one, was how much is that, 30 degrees? 50. So there we have cord 50 from the inside in. There's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And that's, how, that's the pole. So you record the first one, and you do the same for the second, and for the third, and fourth, fifth, sixth. And then you draw a triangle. And if the triangle en encompasses the center, you know you have a problem. That means you have a dead weight. And so you should use, either use initially, underground, use this, or more importantly, use unwedge. And unwedge itself, you put in the strike and dip and the geometry, and, it will, and then you put in the support, and it will tell you what the factor of safety will be. Is that uh, OK? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.